written by Barbara Bard and published by Starfall Publications. Subscribe for more audiobooks. Enjoy. Chapter 1 A clap of thunder echoed off the stone cliffs of the Isle of Mull as Charlotte Browning, newly arrived from Yorkshire to visit with her aunt and uncle to clear her lungs of the dreaded disease of consumption, began to run as fast as she could to escape the sheets of rain that had begun to fall all around her. She had not expected this violent storm, and as she hastened to find shelter, lightning began to tear through the heavens above her, threatening her on every front. Charlotte was not a person who was easily frightened. For several years, contrary to the predictions of the many doctors who had told her parents in hushed tones that she was a terminal case, she had battled this disease known as the wasting disease by some, and tuberculosis by the physicians who were most up to date. She had suffered for years from long nights filled with terrible dreams and terrors, racking coughs and frightful blood-soaked handkerchiefs, until by dint of great effort and determination, the symptoms began to subside. Her doctor, the brilliant young firebrand, Silas Milne, prescribed a rigorous regimen of exercise and fresh air, convinced as he was that it was the awful and dirty air of Sheffield that was most to blame. But Charlotte was determined to make a full recovery against all odds, and it was this that led her to be alone on the Scottish moor, just as this frightening storm descended. Not thirty yards away from the galloping young woman was an old and gnarled tree, garishly lit up by the flashing blasts of lightning that began to burst around her as she ran. It looked something like an oak tree, Charlotte guessed, but it exploded into a million tiny wood chips as it was hit by a bolt of lightning. In the bright flash from the explosion, she saw a vision before her, something unlike anything she had ever seen before. It resembled a man with long, bright, fiery hair, clad in a colourful tartan dress, the like of which she had never seen before. Hello, she cried, raising her arms. She had a sense this apparition had heard her. In the gathering gloom she lost sight of the vision, and with the smattering of lightning flashes around her, the vision receded without responding. Are you safe? she cried. And then she tried very hard to hear the response, but heard nothing but the howls of the wind and the crack of distant lightning. Shielding her face from the pelting water and the flying pieces of wood, Charlotte slowed her pace as she saw the light from the window of the castle only a few hundred yards away. Perhaps it was a mirage or a spirit she had seen, for she had heard that the lands of Mull were haunted by the spirits of the many who had died here in recent years since the Battle of Culloden Moor. Rather than flee from this inclement weather and the spirits that haunted it, Charlotte embraced it, smiling at the feel of the pelting cool raindrops on her face. She tasted the sweet, clean water that fell as a gentle rain from heaven as the storm blew out over the sea. I know I am alive, she said to herself. I know I will live because the Lord has baptised me with the purest water of the Hebrides. Moments later, as she pulled open the large iron-studded oak door, her Aunt Catherine, the slender reed of a Yorkshire woman who had married the great barrel-chested Scotsman, Kenneth Campbell, one of the few Scots who had sided with the English and who had reaped the reward of land that had belonged to the Highlanders, greeted her. Although Charlotte knew little or nothing of the history of these islands, the Campbells were reviled by many Highlanders because of their turncoat ways, and Kenneth was one of the worst. A boorish bear of a man, he cared nothing for the crofters who remained on the island and regularly burned their farms to terrorise the local population. Catherine, though, was a kindly woman, soft-spoken and mousy in her demeanour, given to whispering her responses against the bellows that was her husband's customary speech volume. My dear, you are drenched through and through, she said, bustling to fetch a towel to dab the raindrops from her niece's smiling face. Oh, Aunt Catherine, she gushed, it is most exhilarating. I saw the most magical visions out on the heath. Aye, you are wont to see things that men rarely see out there, my dear, she said in an exaggerated stage whisper, for there is more than the natural world at work here on the Isle of Mull. Charlotte was confused. What do you mean, Auntie? she asked. The people of this island have long spoken of the spirits of the nether realm, for here there are selkies, a sort of people who shapeshift between human and seal. There are spirits that haunt the heath, 
and there are many, many intercessors to the other world, and most of the people have been here before. Charlotte, who never lacked for imagination, smiled with joy at the possibility of living in a place where angels dare to tread, where those beings who live in the half-believed other world appear and interact with the beings from the natural world. I saw one such spirit, she said excitedly. Her aunt blanched. Nay, she said, you didna. Charlotte was taken with the way her aunt had adopted much of the speech pattern of the noble Highland Scots as some sort of gesture of respect. This was in contrast to Kenneth, who did his utmost to lose his hated Scottish accent. It was a fiery being and beautiful figure, similar to a man, but far more exciting and more handsome than any man I have ever seen, she said, breathing heavily still. There are more things here that you can imagine in your wildest dreams. This very sentence filled Charlotte with joy. This was the most wonderful thing she could imagine. Spirits haunting the heath. Oh, auntie, you cannot imagine how wonderful it is to be here among the spirit world. But beware, Charlotte, for the spirits of the highlands are known to be terrible and vindictive. This spirit seemed friendly enough. Aye. The spirits of the netherworld are a dangerous lot. They can fool you into thinking they are helping you whilst plotting your demise. Again, a shiver went through Charlotte. She was thrilled by this idea and vowed to learn more about the spirits. As her aunt went to get some tea to warm her gullet, Charlotte took her leather-bound notebook from the folds of her skirts and set to work writing down her experience for further reflection. She sat at a small table, alone and lost in her thoughts and reveries as Mary, the young Scottish girl who was employed as a maid, came by. She stood by Charlotte silently watching for several minutes until Charlotte became aware of her. What is it, Mary? asked Charlotte. It's only that the mistress has told about your experience, Miss Charlotte. Please, Mary, I want to be friends. Just call me Charlotte. I will, Miss. Charlotte. Your auntie tells me o' your experience on the heath. Tis a boon to see a selkie you ken. A boon? Aye, they bear the tidings from the netherworld. You've been Gina Wink into the spirit world. Her Scottish brogue was pronounced and exciting to Charlotte, who was thrilled by everything Scottish. I am honoured then, said Charlotte. Aye, tis a boon, but you must find out more about the spirits. Learn all you can so they dinna take you away to live amongst their kith. I shall. That is why I am putting Quill to paper, said Charlotte, to learn about them. A wise thing to do, Miss Charlotte. The Selkies live in the caves aboon the rocks by the sea. I'll explore them tomorrow. She moved away like a ghost, silently and mysteriously. Charlotte picked up her quill and began to write. Chapter 2 the next morning Charlotte rose early in the morning, drank her tea by the window, watching the mist blow out to sea as the wind rose, and decided she would go and explore the caves Mary had told her about. She rose, donned her black hooded cape over her dress, and made her way to the door. On the way, she saw her Uncle Kenneth. I hear you've been exploring the bloody heath, he said, and somehow even his voice sounded threatening. He looked over her a giant of a man, over six feet tall and thick like a peasant. Something about him made Charlotte cringe, but she fought the tendency because he was her uncle by marriage. Since she arrived, she had heard his violent side from the other room as he drank tumbler after tumbler of Scotch whisky, bellowing his terrible opinions and bitterness into the night. Aunt Catherine, who had married him in his youth, had seen him develop into what can only reasonably be called a hate-filled man. She'd sit quietly and listen to him as he cast aspersions about every Scotsman he knew. They are a scurvy lot, these Celts, he said, swallowing a tumbler full of Scotch whisky. I tell you, they would slay your brother as soon as look at you. You cannot trust a single one of them. Catherine smiled at his awful ideas, knowing there was no longer any hope of returning the carefree young man she had met while on a visit to Edinburgh all those years ago. Yes, dear, she said, and her words seemed to inspire him to a fresh volley of vitriol. You can ne'er entrust a thing to a Scotsman. 
they are a bloodthirsty lot. I have vowed to rid this scourge from the Isle of Mull, he said, getting up and advancing on Catherine, who cowered at the approach of her husband. Charlotte listened, waiting for the sound of violence, and was grateful when all she heard was the shattering of a glass against the stone floor of the great castle floor. Blast! he shrieked. That was the night before, and she suspected his current outburst was inspired by the story she had told of the sighting of the Selkie. For Kenneth was not a superstitious man, but he believed the crofters were undermining his authority. And each time he heard another story, he would organise a party of men to burn one of the thatched roofs of the cottages that were still scattered around the island. Today, though, Charlotte had the innocent idea to investigate the caves around the seashore. I took a wee walk yesterday, but the weather got the better of me, she said, smiling. Somehow her smile inspired him to a rage again. It's a place of evil winds, he said, his huge eyebrows rising up threateningly on his face. The redness of his skin and his tiny pink-ringed blue eyes looked like firebrands on his pockmarked skin. Charlotte tried to imagine the young man Catherine had fallen in love with, but the scourge of smallpox had wrought its disfiguring fury on him, and he no longer bore any resemblance to the portrait she saw hanging in the dining hall. She'd examined it one day and noted that it was inscribed, Sir Kenneth Campbell, Lord of the Isles. She knew this could not be the truth, of course, as the Campbells were not the Lords of the Isles, but she suspected it was an aspirational title rather than a real one. She knew he had been granted Kinlockby Castle, which she knew was the hereditary seat of the Marquis of Lockby, a Maclean who had lost it when the English monarch found him guilty of treason for taking up arms against the Crown. How this came about she did not know, and she dared not ask. She only knew that it had filled her uncle's heart with black rage, and his addiction to the Scottish national drink was not a help in quelling his fury. Thank you, Uncle Kenneth, she said, smiling again. I shall avoid the winds and stray only as far as I feel safe. There's no safe harbour in these parts, he said. Charlotte brushed past him, and as she felt his presence cringe from her, filling her heart with dread. Something was wrong with this man, she knew. Something had turned his heart to stone. She dreaded finding out what it was. She noticed how all the servants were terrified of him, and throughout the castle, a pall was palpable in every corner of the place, as though the stones themselves were at war with this angry man. I thank you, uncle, she said quietly, moving past him. As a response, he spat on the stone floor in front of her. The spittle itself seemed to curdle as it hit the stone. Out on the heath, Charlotte felt her spirit soar as the morning sky had cleared and the sun even seemed disposed to shine. A rare thing on this windswept isle. Her heart lifted, though, and her steps were light. She was truly recovered from her long illness, she felt. The truth was that Charlotte had lost hope of ever living a normal life more than a year ago when fighting the battle against consumption and realising her chances of marrying well were gone. Now that she was twenty-four years old, she was far too thin to be fashionable. Growing up in a manor house in Sheffield with her parents, the Earl of Tremaine, she had thought her fortune rested on finding a suitable partner in a good marriage. Of course, this was the dream of every young lady of her station, but being struck with consumption at age seventeen, most of the gentlemen who might have found her appearance entrancing were repelled by this dreaded disease. And now that she had conquered it, she was, to all intents and purposes, an old maid. Charlotte had come to terms with this appellation and took it in stride. She was grateful for life of any kind, and not the least bit disturbed that she would never have children. Disappointed to be sure, but not terribly worried. As she made her way to the shore, she picked her way gingerly through the rocks that made up the shoreline. She was filled with the spirit of adventure and the sights. As rustic and primordial as they seemed, they filled her romantic heart with happiness. She had long since banished thoughts of romance and replaced them with ambition as a writer. For she had heard about the lady writers who had made their mark on the world without the need of a husband. Eliza Parsons, or even the poetess from Mull, Mayred Nigan Lachlan, whose poetry she had found in translation from the Gaelic tongue. 
Charlotte found a welcoming rock on which to sit and opened her notebook. She began to read her reminiscences from the day before. And lo, I made my way through the heath, in this wild, windswept isle, as the storm that had been brewing off the coast made landfall. A hoary wind began to blow, and with it the brusque fires from heaven began to wreak their havoc on the land. Lightning bolts, aimed with deadly precision, struck one age-old sentinel, an oak tree, portending the fall of the empire. She smiled at her ambition and her overwrought prose. She was a poetess in the tradition of Lachlan, after all, she mused. But there amid the fury of the gale arose a sprite, emerging as from the flames, with hair of purest red and a costume of rare manufacture. He was well made and handsome, but as from the nether regions of the spirit realm, a selkie, as Mary the Scotswoman called him, a creature neither man nor beast but something in between, home to him were the crags of the coast, the warrens of the beasts, and yet to me he was the handsomest of men. She looked up from her notebook and pondered what should happen next in her narrative, smiling at her unique genius. Closing her eyes, she felt the breeze blow through her dark tresses and felt the beauty of the North Sea, much as she imagined the Frankenstein monster must have felt his freedom in the wind. Charlotte was a creative soul, and the joy of immersing herself in the wilds of the Hebrides filled her heart with ideas of narrative originality. And then all of a sudden, she spied him again. That fiery sprite she had only glimpsed in the flash of the lightning was there before her, not two hundred yards off. Instinctively she waved. He had clearly seen her, as he had just emerged from the woods, and she was clearly sitting high on a crag by the water. She was bewildered by the lack of a response. Hello, she called. He clearly heard her because his head swivelled around in her direction. She saw, all of a sudden, his face clearly and unmistakably human, and terribly, terribly ruggedly handsome. Even at some distance off she could see that he was a stunning specimen of a man. He was clad in a tartan kilt and a plaid, a tam upon his head, holding down a mane of bright red hair that flew in the breeze like fire. Charlotte was smitten instantly, for he was unlike any man she had ever seen before. He was tall and broad-shouldered, with powerful arms and legs perfectly muscled. He moved like a wild animal, stealthily and swiftly, his hair blowing in the wind. His rugged face was bearded with a soft, downy beard of light brown hair. He had a beautifully straight nose and a strong jaw that gave him the look of great strength and intelligence. And his huge eyes, those windows to his soul, also allowed great wisdom to emanate from them. He froze in place, standing there by the seashore, staring at the raven-haired maiden who was sitting by the shore. There was some feral instinct that seemed to be confused by her presence. He seemed to be drawn to her, but some deeply ingrained fear caused him to retreat. As Charlotte called to him with a smile on her lips. She saw this attraction in his eyes, yet also the fear, the worry of an unknown quantity in his life. Suddenly, as she rose to approach him, he bolted like a wolf. Scarcely had she gotten to her feet when she noticed he had vanished, much faster than any man could possibly have left. A sense of wonder pervaded her imagination, and she sat again to write down her impressions of this wild haired Adonis. Her mind raced with thoughts as mad as the vision she had just seen. She knew there was no man like this on the island, and yet she saw twice with her own eyes that he was real. This realisation, along with her sense of herself as a creative spirit, filled her with the spirit of the chosen. And with that, he vanished. Charlotte leaned into her notebook and scribbled as fast as she could to capture this moment of wonder and magic engendered by this figure she had seen on the shore. Where he had gone was a mystery, and in her mind he was taken up into the heavens. All that was left was her smile as wide as the heavens itself. Chapter 3 That very night, as she made her way back to Kinlochby Castle, Charlotte felt as though her feet barely touched the ground. She was transported with the feeling of one who had been touched by an angel. Entering the castle, 
She made her way to her chambers where she deposited her notebook by her bed and changed into a dress more appropriate for dining. She chose a ruby gown embroidered with golden designs along the hem, with long, narrow sleeves ending in a wide lace. The dress was split down the front, exposing her sky-blue satin underdress. It was a beautiful gown, chosen especially for her journey up to the Scottish islands by her mother, who had hoped she would be inspired by the wild landscape. This dress was one of her best. She made her way to the long dining hall, noticing the long table that had doubtless been used to entertain the great chieftains of the Highlanders. Today, however, it was only for her aunt and uncle and herself seated at the far end of the table. Sir Kenneth and Lady Catherine were already seated as she entered the room. Catherine rose, welcoming her, while Kenneth remained seated, ignoring her entrance in a most impolite manner. She noticed that he had a half-empty bottle of scotch at his elbow and a stout tumbler of thick glass. He appeared to have enjoyed some of this liquor already, for his eyes were hazy with the bitterness that is so often the result of the amber liquid. Well, said Kenneth, I see you've finally seen fit to join us. Charlotte was taken aback by this angry outburst. At first she was tempted to respond to it with anger, but seeing his already angry demeanour, she decided to let it go. And how was your day, Aunt Catherine? she asked, turning to her aunt. Well, I had a very nice day, Charlotte, she said in something akin to a whisper. Speak up, woman, yelled Sir Kenneth. You're like a wee mouse with your whispering. Pardon me, my dear, she said, cowering. And what mischief have you been up to today, Charlotte? bellowed Sir Kenneth, turning to her. I saw the spirit man again today, she offered. The what? In truth, I know not what he was. But I have been told it was a selkie, she responded. Rubbish, cried Sir Kenneth. There's no such a thing. If you saw something, you saw a villain, a sheep stealer, or a cattle thief. Some brigand, sure as shooting. Well, I'm sure I know not what he was, but he was a very pleasant sight indeed, clad in a red tartan and kilt. Then it's surely a rebel from the clan Maclean, he said, leaning into her and quaffing yet another glass of the poison he so enjoyed. A rebel, said Charlotte. I thought they had been routed from this island. They have, for the most part, and that tartan is a sign of their villainy. These rebels want to unseat me from the castle, and by God they'll meet with resistance if they lift a hand against me. I'll not countenance rebellion in my lands. I must say, uncle, he seemed a most friendly sort. Did he approach you then? He did not. Indeed, he made off when I greeted him from a distance. Aye, they're a scurvy lot, those Macleans. Canna let the past be the past. They bear their grievances and their bloodlust agin me. When he was angry, Charlotte noticed his Scottish brogue was on full display. How was he clad? he stormed. Charlotte furrowed her brow and took a sip of the blood-red wine before her. Its acrid flavour cleared her head, and she pondered her memory of the man. I believe he was clad in a red and green tartan kilt, and a plaid over his shoulders, and a tam o' shanter upon his head. He wore tartan hose too, and high black leather boots. If I remember well, he had at his side a claymore, one of those broadswords that I hear the Highlanders use in battle and perhaps he had a bow and arrows, held in a quiver. Kenneth laughed grotesquely. Well then, my little dear, what you saw was a Highlander bent on our destruction. These are to be feared, and the only way to rid ourselves of this scourge is to cut them down like dogs. He spat on the ground as though to punctuate his utterance. I do not know what he was. I only know what I saw. And he looked friendly and not like a bloodthirsty Highlander, said Charlotte quietly. I see, thundered Sir Kenneth, and you are an expert now on the bloodthirsty Scots then, are you? You wee sleek and timorous beastie, he guffawed. You'd not know your own murderer if you saw him plain as day. He emptied the last of the scotch into his glass and tossed it down his throat, then threw the bottle to the floor where it shattered dramatically. Mary, he bellowed even louder than the shattered glass, just as Mary, having heard the shattering glass, leapt into the room. I'll take care of the shards, she said. Will you need another bottle, my lord? Does a fish need water? Does a wolf need its prey? 
By God, I'll have another bottle or I'll have your head, he shrieked, his head clearly swimming from the effects of the drink. Mary scampered off and returned with a broom in a moment. She made short work of the broken glass and placed a bottle of scotch on the table. Bring it here, wench, yelled Sir Kenneth. And where is the dinner? I've made a wee haggis, my lord, said Mary. I'll fetch it in. We are portion of neeps. Can you no speak English then, you slut? Sir Kenneth bellowed at Mary. I'll no abide that tongue in this castle, for we are part of Great Britain and the language of Britannia is English, not this misbegotten tongue you call Scots. Not another word or I'll have you thrashed. Charlotte was taken aback by this anger. She had seen Sir Kenneth angry before, but he seemed to have grown angrier with every word she said. They ate in silence. The haggis was flavoured with a delicate nutmeg, and it was of exquisite quality. What is this dish, Mary? asked Charlotte. It's a lovely blend of oats and sheep offal, she said quietly. It's a disgusting mess of guts and oatmeal, not fit for a dog, shrieked Uncle Kenneth, tossing the pewter plate to the floor with a crash, spilling the haggis over the stone floor. My darling, said Catherine, if you don't like the haggis, we can have a nice roast made for you. Mary looked shocked as though someone expected her to produce a roast at a moment's notice. Her eyes dashed from face to face, desperate for something to say or do to save her neck. I'll have no other meat, he said. Bring me some oatcakes and cheese. Mary heard this with a sigh. Yes, my lord, she said, scampering off to fetch the cheese and oatcakes. Charlotte finished her meal in silence as Sir Kenneth stewed and angrily grunted while crunching on his oatcakes. From time to time he made indistinguishable grunts and roars, while Charlotte looked to her aunt for guidance on how to behave. Catherine, for her part, seemed to know that there was no conversation to be had at a dinner that was presided over by a drunken Sir Kenneth, and did her best not to bait the bear that he had become. When she had finished, Charlotte rose. Might I be excused? she asked, not knowing to whom she was addressing this request. Be off wi ye, said a clearly drunken Sir Kenneth. Gee oot me sight, he drawled angrily, tossing his plate in her direction, narrowly missing her. Charlotte scampered off to her bedchambers, closing and locking the door behind her. She was genuinely afraid that Sir Kenneth would be coming after her, and she could not guess what would happen if he did. Safe within her chambers, she opened her notebook and reread the passage about the beautiful young man she had seen, dreaming of salvation at his hands. She smiled at the thought and began to write further, inspired by the fiery anger of Sir Kenneth and wondering why he had such anger in his soul. She suspected he had lost his way and no longer followed the one true path of salvation. She had heard that the Scots had a version of Christianity informed by the Roman Church and infused with the animism she had seen on display in the references to selkies and sprites. She took her Bible and thumbed through it nervously, trying to find a way to calm herself. She opened it to Leviticus 4, where she began to read in hopes it would offer her solace. If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbour, then he shall restore that which he took. He shall even restore it in the principle, and shall add the fifth part more thereto, and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. She closed the book, pondered the meaning of these words and realised there was something terribly amiss in this household. For by his own admission, Sir Kenneth had taken away the lands of the Maclean's, and it had poisoned his soul. What must be done, though? she asked herself. For I am but a weak woman and cannot stand up to Sir Kenneth, who is a brute and a drunkard. And yet I must do something, for to stand by and watch another sin is to sin oneself. Doubling down, she wrote her thoughts in her notebook, praying Sir Kenneth would never see it. Of course, she reminded herself that Sir Kenneth was not known to be a reader. In fact, she doubted that he was even able to read. Although, according to Aunt Catherine, he had been a fine gentleman in his youth before the smallpox had driven him, turning his heart to bitterness and revenge against a perceived wrongdoer. Before she knew what she was writing, she had fallen asleep. In her dream, Charlotte was wandering by the seashore, and a warm wind cooled her as she basked in the sunshine. 
It was a warm day, and the beauty of the earth was on full display. She sat herself on the soft and warm sand that surrounded her, and she closed her eyes, feeling the warm breeze on her neck. And in that same moment, she felt a firm hand on her arm. She opened her eyes and looked straight into the soul of the Highlander, clad in his beautiful kilt and plaid. You are my destiny, he said, his voice melodic in the woodnote tones of the Scottish braes. If you'll coom wi' me, bonny lassie, I'll show ye a life of great beauty. Without a word, Charlotte took his hand and embraced him there on the beach. His soft beard caressed her face as she kissed his soft red lips. Who are you, fair Highlander? she asked softly. I am the man you've dreamt of a your life long, he replied. Yes, you are, she enthused. And as he led her along the beach, she noticed a beautiful manor only a short distance away where liveried servants awaited their approach. And what is this place, my prince? she said dreamily. My lassie, this is your hame, for we'll be married this very day if you'll pledge me your word. I give it with all my heart, fair Highlander, she replied. And standing before the manor house, in the presence of the liveried servants, she and the wild Highlander kissed again as he took her in his arms and held her as though his life depended on it. Softly, he took her to a huge down-filled bed, covered with soft furs of fine ermine, and gently and lovingly he laid her down, smothering her with kisses. I love you, my wild Highlander, she murmured, and yea, my bonny lass, you are the one and only for me. I love ye, darling Charlotte, he replied, kissing her on her bare neck and caressing her breasts. She felt herself rising off the bed as though she were floating, still entwined in his powerful arms, and she grasped him by his broadly muscled forearms and pulled herself into his embrace. She knew at the moment that heaven was at hand. There was a sudden crack as though the front door was being battered by a battering ram, and Charlotte was awakened with a jolt. Her dream dissipated suddenly, and like a shattered glass it tinkled into a million pieces, none of them distinguishable as anything but a weapon of war. She sat bolt upright in her bed, terrified by the violent sound, and listened for another hint as to what was happening. Nothing. It was quiet as a tomb in the castle, but she was certain she had heard something hitting the heavy iron-studded oak front door. Taking the candle, she had lit from beside her bed, she flew to her own door and pulled the deadbolt aside and flung the door open. Silently, she made her way, in bare feet, through the cold stone corridor of the castle toward the front door. In the flickering light of the candle, the walls were eerie and ominous, so unlike the manner of her dreams. Heavy flagstones were the floor, and the cold was almost unbearable on her feet. Yet she arrived at the entrance hall and examined the door. It appeared to be intact and undisturbed. She put her hand on the door to feel any disruption to the wood. It seemed solid. Gingerly she slid the latch open and opened the three locks that held the door secure. Putting the candle on a table beside the door, she heaved it open. It opened onto the heath, and in the moonlight, covered over with fleeting clouds, she saw only the barren lands. Not a soul was outside as far as she could see and not a living thing stirred. She listened for a sound but heard nothing. Only the wind. Gently she pushed the door closed, the creaking of the hinges the only sound. Gently and carefully she replaced the locks into their position and fastened the latch, picked up the candle, and in great bewilderment she returned to her room. There she closed and locked the door and returned to her bed. For the remainder of the night, she slept fitfully, worried that someone or something would invade her sleep. In the morning she rose, feeling unrefreshed. She splashed cold water from the basin by her window on her face. The cold water on her skin made her brace herself for another day with the raging bull that was Sir Kenneth. With a sigh, she made her way to the dining room. Chapter 4 Charlotte found herself drawn to the sea. It was only a few hundred yards from the front door of Kinlochboy Castle, 
and something about the throbbing, repetitive nature of the gently washing waves attracted her. This day was a beautiful day in August, and she knew the weather would be fair all day, and so she felt the freedom to explore the island more than she had before. And of course she felt a strong desire to be away from her uncle, whose behaviour at dinner the night before had disturbed her terribly. Stepping between the large boulders of the shore was difficult, but rewarding to Charlotte. She hiked up her dress and stepped from rock to rock, noticing the teeming life at the water's edge. There were frogs and newts teeming among the rocks and the brackish water there, as well as small crabs and prawns that hid among the algae in the deeper water. As she looked out over the bay, there was a disturbance in the water. It was difficult to know exactly what it was, and with all the talk of selkies, she was unsure what exactly she was seeing. It was only a matter of time, though, until the mystery was solved, because a dolphin or a porpoise broke the surface and flew into the air. This appearance was shocking to Charlotte, because it happened so close to her where the water was clearly deep but worryingly near at hand. And as the animal splashed again into the water, she could almost feel the spray that came over the water. And before she knew it, the animal was making its way slowly toward her, as though she had piqued its curiosity. This phenomenon was surprising to her as Charlotte had always believed that the animal kingdom was separate and different from the realms of mankind. But this animal was behaving like a person, and she knew all of a sudden how it was not difficult to imagine a very close relationship between the animal kingdom and that of man. This porpoise, huge and bulky though it was, looked at her with surprisingly human eyes, smiling in her direction like a kindly uncle basking in the water. Suddenly Charlotte was overcome with a strange feeling, an attraction that she did not understand, luring her back to the land. She looked in the direction of the place the dolphin was pointing with its beak, and although she could not know what this force was, when she looked to where she was being drawn, she saw something there between the rocks a little bit above the water level. It was a dark patch that appeared somehow different from the rest of the shoreline. It was dark and empty. She rose and began to walk toward it. As she did, the dolphin increased its chattering. The closer she got to this thing, the more the dolphin chittered, and the closer she got, the more ominous this opening became. It became clear after she neared it that it was a cave mouth, and it appeared that there may have been something or someone who had been there recently. She looked around to see if there was anyone around, but Mull was sparsely populated in that part of the island and so, as usual, she was all alone. It was, in fact, one of the things she liked most about the island, and the thing that appeared to do best for her recovery. Since she had appeared here, she had hardly spoken to a soul, and this solitude, along with the lovely light breezes and fresh air, was the major reason she felt she was gaining strength and vitality so quickly. She had noticed, in fact, that her gaunt face had begun to show the effects of a good diet and fresh air. Her skin had regained the pinkish hue that she had aspired to for so many years, and her once angular face had become quite beautiful now that it had rounded out. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor hit the subscribe button. This way, we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Approaching the mouth of the cave, she noticed that the ground, though pebbled, appeared to be well trod. It made her suspect that a large animal, perhaps a bear, may be inhabiting this rather large cave. In order to avoid any unpleasant encounter, and knowing very little about bears, Charlotte stopped and made her way to the shore where she looked about for a thick branch that might serve as a brand to light her way in the darkness of the cave. The dolphin was still chittering away close to her, and as she looked about, she found a short length of wood that had washed up on the beach many days before. It had been sun-bleached and dried by the largely dry weather they had been having recently, with the exception of that frightful lightning storm a few nights earlier. Taking a flint that she had in her satchel, she struck it against a rock to make a spark and lit a small taper, holding it up to this piece of wood, which, in a matter of minutes, lit up like a candle. She took the stick and held it aloft as she clambered into the dark cave. 
and it was a very rewarding search too, for inside the cave she found a room which bore the signs of human modification. Although the cave had a high ceiling, the floor had been flattened by human hands, and it now resembled a room. Indeed, a little further along this room she could see that there was another room-like opening. Charlotte was not a timid person, but never having encountered a bear was neither in the mood to meet one today. However, she found a spot to put the brand into an opening in the wall, giving light around her. She sat on an outcropping that served her as a seat. Looking around this magical place, she could hear the sea, much the way a seashell could sing when held up to the ear. Only this was a large cave and the sound was far more soothing. Sitting in this dimly illuminated space, she felt a sense of calm descend on her in a way that she had not felt since she was a child. This was her hiding place, somewhere that Kenneth could never find her in time of need. Sitting here, her solitude became a welcome visitor, and she withdrew her notebook from her satchel and took out a pencil, one of the things she had brought with her from Yorkshire. Although it was more difficult to use than a quill, she felt more comfortable using this than she did with ink and quills. Happily, she began to write. Inspired as she was by the writings of the ladies she had been reading of late, there was nothing quite so inspiring in any of her books as this cave. It is like the great Scottish hero, Robert the Bruce, who, while hiding from Edward Longshanks before the Battle of Bannockburn, was hiding in a cave not unlike this one. It too, she wrote, was on a lonely windswept island in the North Sea. Defeat had dogged him at every turn, and he felt close to despair. He spied a spider high above him on a beam. The small spider tried to hurl itself to a neighbouring beam but failed. Robert counted its attempt six times. If this spider fails on the seventh attempt, then I, like this spider, shall abandon my seventh attempt to take Scotland, he vowed. And there, in that lonely cave, he watched the spider hurl its little body into the void and clutch furtively onto the beam. There it placed its thread and began a large web. It succeeded, he said to himself, and I too shall set out and try once again. From there, Robert the Bruce came out of hiding, gathered his great Scottish army and routed the English from the land. He became King of Scotland known as Robert the Good, and led his people to a great time of wealth and peace. Charlotte smiled at her little story. It was good and she was clearly inspired, although the branch had begun to sputter a little. Suddenly she heard a noise like an animal. It was a sound like a scattering of rocks, and her ears perked up, listening for something that would signal danger to her. The harder she listened, the less she could hear, though, except for the sounds of the sea. She rose, thinking the bear she feared may have returned. Another noise was heard. In her haste, as the branch finally went out, plunging her into darkness, she scampered over the rocks to the cave's opening. With a sense of desperation, she looked around, and seeing no one, calmed herself a little. She smiled at her foolishness. I am, after all, a silly girl, she scolded herself. But then she definitely heard a sound. It was the sound of rustling in the nearby forest. Desperately, she looked for an escape in the event that the bear charged out of the forest, thinking she was invading its home, and dashed over the large rocks of the shoreline in the direction of the castle. Before she could encounter this fearsome bear, she ran as fast as her feet would carry her, and didn't stop until she was on the well-kept grounds of the castle. She had impressed herself with her daring and good health. She was able to run swiftly, and she had no fear of wild animals, even in a dangerous cave that was unknown to any other living soul. As she walked briskly to the castle door, she realised she had forgotten her notebook in the cave. Oh, bother, she said to herself. I do hope I shall be able to retrieve it tomorrow. Then she smiled at her affectation. She had begun to take on the speech patterns of the heroines of her novels, and started to lose any sense that she was a grown woman living in Scotland in the late 1740s. She laughed at herself and vowed not to give in to these sentimental notions. Back in her room, she prepared herself for the awful possibility of another frightful luncheon with Aunt Catherine and Uncle Kenneth, hoping he would be able to control his fiery temper for an hour of good conversation.
particularly now that she had much to relate. Nevertheless, she vowed to tell no one about the discovery of the cave. This was to be her haven in case of trouble or worry. She lay down on her bed for a moment and let her eyes close, waiting for lunch. Chapter 5 Colin MacLean, self-styled Laird of the Isles, and Marquess of Lochby, had been dispossessed by the Highland clearances. He had fought bravely at the Battle of Culloden, under the leadership of Bonnie Prince Charlie, who commanded the cavalry forces on the moor. Colin rode his horse and took up arms against the English and the butcher they called Stinking Billy and the English Sweet William. It was an hour he would never forget. Bogged down and sweating, bullets flying overhead, and his horse mired in the bog, he urged his steed onward until there was nowhere left to charge. He watched as his countrymen were cut down in a hail of bullets. And then the grape shot began, filling the air and cutting down even more of his countrymen, the Chisholms and the McClauchlands, with terrible wounds. He decided there was no winning this battle when he saw his own countrymen, the Campbells, attacking his comrades. There was nothing to do but flee back to his young wife, where he vowed to survive and take care of his family. His father had died years before, and Colin had full command of Mull. His young wife, Morag, a beautiful young maiden and daughter of Hamish McClarchlan, had married him the year before in a ceremony that was attended by all the thanes in the Highlands. It was here that they decided to stand with Charles Edward Stuart to take back their country. Inspired by his passionate love for Morag and his country, Colin vowed fealty to the passionate young prince who had gathered an army and marched on London, only to turn back, inexplicably, the year before. His sister, Flora, had also married several years before. She chose Colin's best friend and steward, Duncan Macfarlane. Together, they had a son, Angus, who was brilliant and resourceful but only five years old. Together they decided there was nothing to do but race to the Isles, along with Bonnie Prince Charlie, who was dressed in women's clothing to hide his identity and help him escape to Skye. On their return from battle, the damage was apparent. Many foot soldiers who had volunteered were dead, with many families broken. There had been an attack by a rogue band of English soldiers on his own household. They had invaded the Great Hall, and his wife Morag, a fiery woman at the best of times, came at them in the absence of any men and slew two of them with the family broadsword before a cowardly third soldier ran her through with his epi. She bled to death on the floor of the Great Hall. When Colin returned, he was met with this grisly sight. As he would often remember, there is no way to describe the feeling of loss when you see the love of your life murdered, surrounded by her own blood. He had not known what had happened, and while he was filled with sadness and grief, he was also filled with anger and the need to avenge her wrongful death. A Highlander is a passionate man, but cruelty and violence perpetrated against his kin inspires him with an unquenchable need for vengeance. Colin, whose passion for Morag was matched only by his love of the land, was filled with hatred for his English conquerors. Those crofters who had managed to live on proved to be his greatest aid in his time of need. For the English soldiers who had come and taken over his castle were routed and killed by the lowly sheep farmers who lived around him. And on his return, he did his best to bring things back for them, fighting through his grief. It was three months of relative peace, a precarious feeling, given the rumours that were swirling of a thing they were calling the Highland Clearances, that Stinking Billy's soldiers were perpetrating. We must prepare for war again, said Duncan as they sat at dinner in the dining hall. Flora and Angus were silently watching the two powerful men. There's no end until the Sassanac is routed. Ah, you have thou right, my brather, said Colin, sipping his goblet of wine. While they are a boon us, there's nay peace. I say we raise an army and return to London, said Flora, causing both Duncan and Colin to laugh. Bonnie Prince Charlie had that idea and it went poorly, said Duncan. And much as I love you, my fair Flora, those days of adventure and invasion are over. We must protect the isle, and that means staying put. Well, if you'll be cowards, I'll have nay truck wi' you, she said, disgusted. Flora, surely you'll have heard the rumours that there is thirty thousand pounds at the head of Charlie. 
I'll have none of my house known as traitors, she declared during the meeting of the clansmen in Kinlockby Castle. If I hear of a single Scotsman who betrays our king, I'll slay him myself. And for months they tried their best to keep things running smoothly, despite the roaming bands of turncoats and Englishmen who threatened their daily lives. It was difficult to keep the faith, partly because it was to this very castle that Charles arrived in August of 1746, dirty and unkempt, cutting quite a pathetic figure. I need transport, was the first thing he said, for I am being pursued every moment of every day by the Sassanac. We've heard about your misadventures, my king, he said, but we've no means to protect your highness on the island, for as ye ken, there are roving bands of English threatening our crofters daily. And there's a rumour that there's a turncoat lowlander who's been given deed to this very doon. I'll arrange a party for you, my king, to take you forth to meet the Frenchies. I'd be most grateful. I'll be spirited away to France, and I shall arrange an invading force from thence. Aye, that is the best plan, said Colin, looking to his thanes to agree. He looked around the hall and saw sceptical faces. We'll need a wee moment to convene and discuss how to make this a right, Your Highness. Very well, said Bonny Prince Charlie, rising as all the thanes rose with him. He was ushered into an adjoining room, allowing the men to discuss the merits of keeping him hidden. There's a cave doon by the shore, said Duncan Macfarlane, his faithful steward and his brother-in-law. We can keep him safe there, away from the hands of the Sassanac. I know nothing about a cave said Colin, sure it me. And the troop went to inspect the cave by the water, for the bonny prince to hide out in until such time as his boat arrived to carry him away. It was this very cave he chose himself, when only a few weeks later, a party of armed men came to take over the castle. Charlie had been safely taken to Skye, and so there was no immediate worry for the country. But one night, as Colin sat down to dinner with his sister and his trusted thanes, a sentry interrupted them to tell them that the thing they had been expecting for months was at hand. There's a party of men, English by their attire, approaching with evil intent, he said breathlessly. We must fight or abandon hope. Nay, said Duncan, for Charlie is hid away in the cave. We should meet them and fight. All the thanes gathered their weapons and prepared for battle. They sallied forth into the moor, in the direction of this party of English foot soldiers. Colin and Duncan had fine horses. With their men gathered around them, they charged, unaware of the cannons set up on a ben only a hundred yards away. As they descended on the English, the cannons began to fire from both sides. They knew at that moment resistance would be useless, but as the foot soldiers began to flee, Duncan spurred his horse onward. A bullet pierced his horse's side, causing it to fall, and Duncan to be thrown over its head, tumbling onto the green. Duncan! he shouted, trying to alert his friend to the fact that the English were advancing protected by the cannon fire. Duncan looked up from his resting place and it was clear that his leg was broken. His horse was in agony, thrashing about, and before Colin could come to his aid, an errant hoof crushed his friend's skull. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.